Hey there, it's Gary Parish. It's Tuesday, December 21st, 2021. Welcome back. CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting dodo birds and leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. He's at home. I'm also at home. Got my passport, my desk, and my office. Shouts to Edible Cookies. And since we last spoke on uh, Sunday night, we have lost yet another in-state rivalry game to this dumb pandemic. On Saturday, we lost Memphis, Tennessee because of COVID issues in the Memphis program. Then on Monday, it was announced we've lost Louisville, Kentucky because of COVID issues in the Louisville program. So Louisville's now on pause. And Deadleg, you broke the news. UK going to play Western Kentucky inside Rupp on Wednesday. Walk us through how that happened. Yeah, well, they, uh, you know, there was some murmurs, I think, um, Sunday into Monday that Louisville might not be able to play. Trivia time. Okay. Okay. How's that? <laughs> My man, you sound like you might have eaten some edible cookies there. We no, do. I have not eaten edible cookies. Um, I'm, I've, I do have a voice issue. It's all right. We're only doing a podcast. It's no big deal. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't. I don't think it's Omicron. Omicron. But, <laughs> That's but, a new thing, by the way. People not knowing how to say that word. Omicron. I think it's. I think it's Omicron. I've heard Omicron, Omnicron, all this. Yeah, Omicron. Omicron. I call it Ocron for short. Ocron. There we go. When I'm just trying to holler at it and say what's Ocron. up, I'm like, what's up, Ocron? There we go. Early trivia time. Okay, not let's go. Called of one. Last time. Last. Penny Crumb. Mm. Sometimes I want to answer the trivia times before you even ask the question. Let me try that one more time. Okay. LeBradford Smith. <laughs> no, but I do like that. Um, Kentucky and Louisville are not going to play in the year 2021. When was the last season, the last time Kentucky and Louisville, Wildcats and Cardinals, last time they did not play? Purvis Ellison. You're, I'm gonna need a year. Oh, but you might be you might be sniffing around a certain era that's close. Purvis Ellison should be a year, as far as I'm concerned. What if we named years after Louisville basketball players? It's time to answer the trivia time. I'm gonna go 19. Well, since you gave me Purvis Ellison, yep. I'm gonna go in the 80s. I'm gonna go 19. 83. That's pretty close. Pretty close. 82-83 was the season in which the Kentucky-Louisville rivalry was revived because, idiotically, mm. these two schools did not play each other for, you know, decades long. It just never happened. And then state legislator actually mandated that the universities must play each other, which was... <laughs> Uh, frankly sensible. And so since 81-82 was the last time that Kentucky and Louisville did not play each other. And so we're going on almost four decades. And the schools have said they're going to try and reschedule this this season if possible. Hell, it might wind up being possible because um, it would be great if these two schools could actually wind up playing each other and figure out a way. But yeah, right now, as it stands, this will be the first time in almost four decades that Kentucky and Louisville will not face each other in the regular season, or at least they're not scheduled to. So can we, we'll stop, can we stop here for a second and acknowledge that was a pretty amazing guess by me? It was wrong, but yeah, it was pretty close. And I also get if I didn't give you Purvis Ellison, like you're probably going like 1964. Let's be honest here. I was always aiming in, in the uh, early 80s. OK, my 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 dart was always aimed in that direction. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I, like, OK, technically wrong answer, but among wrong answers, pretty incredible wrong answer. That's right. Close. You, you give me that, right? Close only counts in horseshoes, hand grenades, and trivia time, apparently. So there we go. Um, so Kentucky reached out to Gonzaga, Texas, Ohio State. Ohio State still on pause. Texas had no interest. And Gonzaga, I mean, Mark Few told me last week, like, he's they're looking to get a replacement game in. Um uh, Mark Few's also been trying to get John Calipari to return and do a trip and play up <laughs> in Spokane. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah, I know. So that didn't materialize. Uh, what did materialize is that Western Kentucky, which was scheduled to play Austin P on Wednesday, Western Kentucky was the school. This wasn't in my story, but I'll report it here, I guess. Western Kentucky was the school that actually initiated contact here. Now, Kentucky fans are aware of this, but 
most people might not be. Kentucky does not schedule Western Kentucky. The last time this team, and by this team I mean Western Kentucky, was able to play at Rupp Arena was in 2001. Kentucky was a preseason top five team, and Western Kentucky wound up winning by 12 in that building, and Kentucky said, we've had enough, see you later. In fact, Wednesday's game is only going to be the third time ever that the teams have met in Lexington. But it's a wonderful story because it makes logistical sense. Also, credit to Austin P for kind of helping to allow this to happen. Um, I had one source initially tell me that Austin P was going to have trouble playing the game, and then another source followed up and said they actually were willing to work with Western Kentucky. They understood the circumstances and things aligned where Austin P was able to say, okay, we'll step out and we'll continue this down the road. Um, so credit to Nate James, former Duke assistant, who's now in his first year at Austin P for helping make this happen. Cause Western Kentucky had to get out of that game to play this one. John Calipari agreed to do it. Um, he agreed to do He's feel uh, Cal's feeling himself after beating Carolina. I think that's what this boils down to. If Kentucky's beaten UNC by three, and we're talking on Sunday's episode about how close of a shave it was, maybe this doesn't wind up happening, but they are going to raise money, some more money for the tornado relief. Obviously, the western part of Kentucky took the brunt of that with the storms in the past week, week and a half here. And uh, I think it was a week ago that Kentucky actually held a telethon that raised at the time more than three million. I was told last night that's up to 4.4 million. So after this game is done, the University of Kentucky, John Calipari, and everyone you know associated with that university that's helped do this is going to have raised well over five million for a part of the country that has been devastated. And you know, I would presume we have a, a listener or two that that lives in that part of the country, and you know. If I'm hoping that these kinds of just amazing charitable acts are are helping bring some comfort, some relief, uh, some reason for optimism going into 2022, um, because those were just devastating storms. So what we have here is an amazing opportunity for a great charitable cause to continue to bring funds and and more resources to a part of the country that really really needs it. I mean, the images that have come out of Western Kentucky and that surrounding region have truly been devastating that th those tornadoes um, were obviously no joke in some of the more uh, eye popping images uh, in terms of weather related disasters we've seen uh, that are happening with increasing frequency in our country in uh, in recent years. We're just not, you know, GP and I and anyone listening or watching that's over the age of, say, 30 or 35. You did not grow up seeing tornado coverage in the month of December, right? Like that just wasn't a thing there. Um, so great on Cal for doing that. And then, by the way, we've got a pretty intriguing game here. These teams don't play each other a lot, understandably so. Kentucky doesn't really benefit by playing Western Kentucky. There's no real, like, upside. But in a pinch, uh, John Calipari made made the decision. He said, no, we're going to bring in the Hilltoppers. Um, and with that, we have a, a pretty intriguing game. Western Kentucky, I think, I'm not going to say they're going to win, but I think WKU is capable of winning. And uh, and so you'll have uh, Jamarian Sharp, who's 7'5" going up against big man Oscar Shibwe as well. So that's pretty cool. So that's basically uh, uh, the long and short of it. And I think it's really cool that, that we had a situation where teams pivoted into a game and it's not just, oh, that's a pretty interesting thing. Kentucky doesn't always play Western Kentucky. It's not just that, Parrish. It's also um, how many people uh, are poised to benefit after going through some just devastating destruction uh, around the region because this game is going to get played. Yeah, the pictures and the video are just... Uh, the videos are just horrific. Um, you didn't grow up having, you didn't have to do tornado drills in school, did you? Actually, I, I did because I, I'm not going to go through my life story here, but. Uh, Tell us your life story. No shot. But I, um, my dad was in the hotel business, so it was like I was the son of a coach because every time he got a new job and basically got promoted, we would move to a different part of the country. So I lived in Louisville when I was younger and I lived in Virginia and uh, lived in Florida. So yes, I would do, I would have to do tornado drills and in Florida, we would do hurricane drills. So I did those in school, but it wasn't something that was consistent throughout my youth. It, does it make me a bad friend slash colleague? I had no idea any of the, any of that you just said. It's okay. No worries. <laughs> I had no idea. I just always assumed you lived way up there. Not always. How yeah. about that? I grew up with tornadoes. I never um, was impacted by one directly. Like, you know, my roof never was torn off my home. But, you know, I can remember as a child, like, okay, it's time to go lay in the bathtub, you know, uh, or at school, it's time to go get in the hallway and put your head between your legs. You know, now now they mostly focus on, uh, you know, uh, sh active shooter drills. 
at schools. Um, we didn't do those when we were a kid. Right. But um, we did have tornado drills. And they're te- tornadoes are terrifying because, like, I-, I can't tell you how many tornado warnings I've been in without ever directly being impacted by one. But it's only luck. You know, like, if a tornado gets you, it's, it's like, there's nothing you can do. Like, it, it, I remember a story of, about a tornadoes in Tuscaloosa several years ago. And it was like, um, these young people and they may have been college students. And as I read the story, it was like the warnings came on and, and it wasn't like they were goofing around like, oh, we're not worried about it. And, you know, they were upstairs playing, you know, PS4 and and the tornado ripped through like they were in the bathroom in a tub covered up with a mattress and direct hit and it's just nothing you can do about that it's just terrifying man so um uh, yeah give credit to to rick and john for making this happen and uh, especially john i guess not that we need to uh, distribute credit 70 30 or anything like that but there's no scenario where western kentucky is not going to take advantage of an opportunity to play kentucky yeah. But but in, you know, certainly UK is coming off of a, um, a, a really nice win, a blowout of, of North Carolina. Um, but, you know, Western Kentucky's on a little run here, too. You know, they, they blasted Ole Miss mm-hmm. 71 48. Um, and then they they beat Louisville by double digits. Um, you know, they, they got off to a rough start one and three. But you know they're seven and one in their past eight. This is this is a real game. This isn't a gimme. How about this? I'm going to assume Western Kentucky is going to play Kentucky better than North Carolina did. And yeah. so for UK to make this happen, um, and for them to still be working on a way to take some of the proceeds and invest it into these communities, like it's all good stuff. Um, so I, I'm, I'm glad they were able to get this done. And it's another example. Um, for different, uh, you know, it, it's another example of coaches being able to work on the fly and and make up for lost things. You know, I, I can just tell you from talking to some of my bosses, you know, trying to schedule games on the fly in the middle of a pandemic is not simple. You know, at, at CBS, they are constantly trying to juggle things like, OK, we just lost this game. What can we do to replace this game? And it is. It makes a complicated job that much more complicated. Um, so anytime coaches are able to, you know, get on, uh, these things just don't happen with a snap of a finger. There's a lot of time spent on the phone, a lot of real discussions. You know, these people are busy, you know, trying to run a basketball program. They're not used to spending two hours on the phone trying to figure out how to, you know, if we can get a game and where we're going to play it and when and who's going to put it on TV. Um, it is added to it's added to the job and for Rick and John and all the people who work with them who were able to make this happen. Um, yeah, that, that's good stuff. And I look forward. I look forward to the game and to, to seeing um, um, the impact the money raised from this game can have in, in getting that part of uh, of the country um, as back to normal as it can get as quickly as possible. Kempom has the game right now. Kentucky winning by seven, 77, 67. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, WKU has the rare opportunity. In fact, I haven't, I haven't checked, uh, you know, schedules dating back the past 70, 80, 90 years, but I'm wondering if, if at any point in its history has Western Kentucky even had the opportunity to play Louisville and Kentucky two big brothers in state in back-to-back situations. Maybe there was a case when, you know, travel and, uh, and really before, you know, teams were hopping on airplanes 70 years ago where, you know, that would have necessitated it with a schedule. But I don't know. Um, but here's here's that chance right now for uh, for the Hilltoppers, which are coming off a 10 point win over Louisville on big CBS when that game had to be flexed in to right. our uh, triple header because we lost the the one game in, uh, in the CBS Sports Classic, of course. And now they're going to come back and get a chance against Kentucky. Kentucky does have a little bit of benefit here in this. We'll see what winds up shaking up with CUSA. Uh, Western Kentucky might wind up being the best team. Maybe not. It's basically Western Kentucky, UAB, Louisiana Tech, throw in North Texas. One of those four is going to probably be the team that finishes at the top of the standings, be the team that represents the conference once we get to the NCAA tournament. And it could well be WKU. So just keep an eye on that. This could wind up being... um, 
say, uh, you know, a, a, a decent enough quad three win for Kentucky. It's not that much upside, but it's also not a complete cupcake where, you know, a win is ap- worth absolutely nothing. WK is a good team. And as GP mentioned, they've, they've done, uh, they've done well right now. And um, by the way, as we speak this morning here, we are at 43 teams this season that have had to go on COVID pause with 30, Six, I believe, of those currently on pause, maybe 37. Georgetown is on pause, and it is not going to be able to play against Providence on Wednesday. So that will induce a forfeit. I'll have more on the the notion, by the way, this week's court report lead story will deal with leagues and forfeits. There are conversations happening today and Wednesday. And I even think a league on Thursday might be having conversations about if they'll change their rules, should they change the rule, and what might change as we adjust to Omicron here. But yeah, if you're, uh, if you're wondering on the number here, we are at 43 total. And I think it's 36 or 37 that, that are, um, that are currently paused here. And uh, even after we, even as we started podcasting here, um, I got to get a Memphis statement in here. Memphis put out a statement. that said they're due to return on Monday, December 27th, barring additional COVID tests. I'm literally getting a scoop right now. Hold on. Literally get, getting one in real time. All right, they haven't sent it. When I get it, we'll see what I can say on live on the podcast here. Memphis says the athletic department and men's basketball program have and will continue to provide education regarding vaccines and the implications of not being vaccinated, as is done with all sport programs, including holding a virtual session as recently as Sunday afternoon with players and their families. While a majority of the teams is vaccinated, the combination of players redshirting, current injuries, positive tests, and contact tracing among the unvaccinated members um, left the program unable to field a team. For Saturday's game, that's that. And this is literally coming in from a source right now. Wake Forest Boston College is off on Wednesday. So that's another one. I don't have the source telling me which program it is, but I can find out in a second. But if you were a Wake Forest or Boston College fan watching live on YouTube, you will not be having a game Wednesday, according to a source. Back to you, Gary Parrish. Let me ask you this. Um, So Memphis is shut down because of unvaccinated players. They have too many of them. Um. Of the other 42 programs that are on pause, and the number seems to be growing by the minute, um, do you have a sense for how many of those um, are caused also by unvaccinated players or relative to programs that are on pause like Ohio State, which is 100% vaccinated. They just had breakthrough cases and and too many players pop positive. Um, do, Do you do you? How rare is the Memphis situation, if it's, if it's rare at all? Just had to decline a phone call, sorry. Um, uh, I think it is rare. Um, there are players that are unvaccinated on some of these rosters that are po- currently paused, and I don't have every single one. I mean, we've got everything from – I'm looking at the list right now. I mean, we've got everything from teams that are fully vaccinated um, – like one that's no longer on pause, like Washington, which was the first Washington's roster is fully vaccinated. Um, but if your question is basically how it reflects upon the situation at Memphis, I don't know of uh, another team that's specifically in that spot. I think it certainly is a possibility. Um, but I have heard many instances where teams have been put on pause because one or two guys caught caught positive COVID taste cases sometimes vaccinated sometimes not vaccinated and then again the team doctor is going to initiate the protocol that is instituted by the medical officials and the university like they have to go through these protocols again these are the rules they're going to go by it and the doctors are not dictated by what the coaches want or the ad wants and so with that some of these schools have then protocol in place that you're going to test the rest of the team and because omicron is ridiculously transmissible I mean, did you see that 73% of the cases in the country right now are Omicron? And last week it was like 5%. It's insane, dude. The doubling effect of Omicron and its breakthrough. That's why when the whole team winds up getting tested, you have these teams sitting out. But I haven't heard of any other team that's currently on pause having a bad vaccination situation. But that's not to say that's not the case because I don't have the, you know, the exact number with every single one of these teams. I'm glad you brought up um, leagues starting to revisit their forfeit policies Um, because we talked about this a lot in the offseason. And I was in favor of it um, then, if only because I thought it would work as another incentive to get teams vaccinated. Like, whatever you can do from an incentive standpoint to get humans vaccinated, but for our purposes, basketball players vaccinated, 
I, I'm in favor of that. And uh, so I was in favor of the forfeiture policies that leagues were implementing. Again, for two reasons. One, it provided an incentive for, t- for coaches to get their teams vaccinated. But secondly, if I'm being completely honest, I didn't think that 100% vaccinated teams would have to go on pause. I was just wrong. I, I don't mind saying that. We're learning as we go. Um, the Omicron variant didn't exist when we were having those conversations. It did not exist when these leagues were putting in their policies. And I think it's smart at this point for the leagues to revisit that. It's one thing when a team like Memphis has to shut down. And the reason is because you've got at least seven unvaccinated players. I don't feel sorry for them. You, you walked into this one, but when a team that's hundred percent vaccinated has to shut down, They've been following all protocols, doing what they're supposed to do. Everybody's got their shots, and you still have to shut down because of breakthrough cases, because of the Omicron variant. Um, I I don't think that's – I don't think making that team take a loss in the league standings is a good thing. Now, I don't know if you can split it and say if you have to shut down because of unvaccinated positives or contact tracing, then that's on you, forfeit. But if you're 100 percent vaccinated or close to that and you just have to shut down because of breakthrough cases, that's not a. I don't know if you can actually, you know, uh, thread that needle Mm -hmm. because who's going to be honest with you? Who's not? I know You, you might you might just have to revisit the policy and just say, given the latest information and we know it is possible for 100 percent vaccinated teams to have to shut down. We're not going to make people take losses in the league standings. Um you know, when, when that kind of thing happens. Um, I, I know that uh, leagues are revisiting these policies right now. And, um, you know, if you give me a vote, I would now vote um, differently than I would have voted five months ago. I would now vote that um, given the, the transmission rate of this variant and the fact that we know 100% vaccinated teams are getting breakthrough cases and having to shut down, I don't think forfeits should be on the table anymore. Yeah, this is what the story uh, court report will deal with specifically on either Wednesday late or Thursday morning. Depends on when I can get all these commissioners. But I talked with the Pac-12 on Monday night and I asked a specific deal. Um, By the way, uh, Nevada versus Grand Canyon is now off the table as well. Again, this is just going to be continually updating here, uh, folks. Um, But I said in the pre because the Pac-12 has the forfeit rule in place and some coaches have now gone to the league office and say, we need to get rid of this. And I asked in the preseason, when you decided all this, you know, three, four months ago, did any coaches in men's basketball oppose this? And the answer was no, but the circumstances have changed. The situation has changed. It remains to be seen if it will change. Um, My expectation is that it will change and it will change with every, at least every power conference, because these conferences are also in touch with each other. And I think they kind of want to be in sync, even though they don't ha- necessarily have to be, but um, yeah, I'll have plenty more on this and where we're going and how soon it can happen. Uh, again, that'll be in the court report on um, Wednesday on cbsports.com either late Wednesday or early Thursday. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when I can kind of reflect upon the story on Thursday's episode. So let's move on to non COVID issues in the sport. NC state got a favorable ruling on Monday in it's I a R P case. Uh, we're going to talk about that next, but first check this out. So NC state got a favorable ruling on Monday and it's I a R P case. The school employed a coach who was involved in a $40,000 payment to a recruit's family, still no postseason ban. If I'm an NC State fan, I'm thrilled, dead leg. You wrote the story on the IARP uh, IARP case. It's the first one coming to a conclusion. What would you make of the way uh, NC State's case was was ultimately handled? Well, it's notable because it was the first IARP, Independent Accountability Resolution Panel, whatever it is at this point. Brain's absolute mush. Um, uh, resolution process. Excuse me, <laughs> um, dude. I'm 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 just I'm struggling here. I I did I trying to get Christmas gifts in time. Amazon. You you get that wrapped up by the way. Christmas shopping. Yeah, everything is done. I even had to do um ex- expedited shipping on some. Like I, oh. it was like, hey, will you pay an extra twelve dollars to make sure this thing is here before Christmas? I was like, of course. 
Yeah, I'm good to go, baby. I'm and I'm good to go. I think as of right before we podcasted, but I was trying to get in an Amazon order that swears it'll be here Thursday for my wife. We'll see. Yeah, um, my, my wife and I decided this Christmas. Tell me if this is um, reasonable or um, or unreasonable. We decided. Look, there's this there's this one thing that she wants that you know it costs a little bit of money, and there's this one thing that I want that costs a little bit of money, and it's more money than you would typically spend on a gift, but there are things that we want, and we just sort of made a deal. You buy your thing. I'll buy my thing. Merry Christmas. Is that okay? It makes you happy. It does make me happy. That's I'm all getting, that matters. I mean, it makes me, like, I still sit here and I go, I cannot believe she spent that much money on that thing. But I'm happy I got to spend so much money on my thing. Okay. It's wonderful to hear. I got people asking if this is a uh, Christmas sweater. It is. It is a little festive, and I'll be festive again for the Thursday show um, as well. So be ready for that. Um, okay, back to the topic at hand here. So, yes, uh, the IARP, the first case that got resolved, even ahead of, I'm going to say it, Memphis, was NC State. Memphis is obviously not FBI-related. NC State is slash was. And so it's notable because we wanted to see how uh, – severe the sanctions would be against nc state and they're really not that severe i didn't know like i i, I once we got word that this was going to be coming down on monday i i thought what's really going to happen here i wasn't sure but if you had made me pick you know postseason ban or no postseason ban i would have said no postseason ban if you would have said is it going to lean lighter or heavier i would have said you know what nc state it's going to lean a little bit lighter because mark godfrey the former coach who's still technically employed at Cal State Northridge, but has been on administrative leave since April. Forget this. Potential infractions not tied to NC State. <laughs> did, did my man go to Cal State Northridge and just start cheating again? What are we doing? I mean, he's still, he's still on um, admin leave from CSUN, as the kids call it. Uh, he got a one-year show cause from the IARP. Again, you cannot appeal IARP. That's the whole deal is you take your chance with IARP and you accept the punishment as it lands. Uh, Orlando Early, the former assistant, who I literally sat next to as he was recruiting Dennis Smith on the rec on the recruiting trail like, you know, all those years ago. Talk with this dude about Dennis Smith, Bam Adebayo. You know, he was uh, and this a lot of this stuff, by the way, I was there in court, like it, it, all this stuff came up. And the reason why this came up, oh, by the way, I put this in the story. You should have put a gun on him. He probably was carrying at least 12 grand. Not, okay. You could have put a gun on him. You could have put a gun on him. Run the jewels. Uh, uh, there was there was there was no run the jewels situation happening in, in I think it was Vegas when we saw Dennis Smith play. Uh, That's a great place to put a gun on somebody. So. You could have committed armed robbery. He 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 got a six year show cause. Did Mister Early? Godfrey got a one year. NC State was given well it has to vacate those like you know, fifteen wins and thirteenth place finish in the ACC from Dennis Smith's time uh, at the school. Um, they lose one scholarship this year. Next year, there's some typical recruiting uh, reductions. Nothing huge here, but it's the first one. Now, again. Godfrey left. No one from that time is at the school anymore. And I and I and since NC State really tried to work with the NCAA and then the IARP, IARP to like reduce this as much as possible, um, I think that should be taken into account. If you are a Kansas fan or an Arizona fan or an LSU fan, uh, <laughs> she'd be still doing the run the jewels. Um, I don't think you necessarily should be looking at this news, this headline these sanctions from the IARP to NC State and thinking that you're in the clear. I don't think that will be the case. And as a reminder, we mentioned this some time back. Um, a lot of those schools, those res, those returns are not coming for months. They're not coming this season, maybe in the summer. I had a source tell me, don't expect anything on like Arizona and Kansas until next fall. Like it could still be a long, long time. So just keep that in mind. I'd love if things change and that got expedited and we got to put, push this thing up. But I don't think so. But yeah, Dennis Smith Jr. got paid $40,000 by uh, technically the money was dropped off by his trainer and it was facilitated uh, by Orlando early. And as I was going to mention a second ago, before you uh, suggested that I should commit armed robbery, um, TJ Gasnola, former uh, Adidas associate, helped run programs there. He flipped and became a cooperating government witness when this whole FBI trial thing happened. And it was because of that that this is even a thing. 
like the FBI didn't have information on NC State cheating to land Dennis Smith Jr. and keep him committed to NC State going forward and all that. Um, because Gasnola flipped and they were able to uh, get more information out of him, get more documents and records, that's when they found out, oh, by the way, he had been doing things to help NC State land Dennis Smith Jr. And since this is now well past us and 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 behind us, um, this is just a classic case. And again, a lot of this stuff was revealed and I reported it on the time at the time in federal court. But this is one of those classic cases, and this happens plenty in football too, where there's just a lot of smoke and noise around a certain program recruiting a certain player, and people believing that that program was doing was just cheating, was breaking the rules to land a player. That noise was absolutely there in the wake of Dennis Smith's commitment to NC State, and it just took a federal investigation for it to actually be, um, you know, found out and uh, with incontrovertible evidence on the record. And so here we are, uh, Dennis Smith Jr., by the way, still in the NBA, NC State, no postseason ban, and it finally gets to move on. And it's the first of many IARP cases that are going to be settled again in the months to come. Uh, Dana Welch was the panel chair, and she um, said that um, when she was explaining the decision to not deliver a postseason ban, that they were uh, reluctant to punish the students that are currently competing. If you're Louisville, Kansas, LSU, Arizona, Memphis, anybody else that has an IARP case, um, do, do you interpret that as an encouraging statement? Not necessarily. I, I mean, encouraging? I don't know. I, I mean, the, the, the bar is set. This school's paid $40,000 for a player. I did, any, did anybody else pay more than that for anybody? Mm, for a specific player? I don't think so. I'm trying to remember all the... I don't think we ever got the numbers exactly right on the. No, list. like uh, there's not something that's like the one with with Aiton and Miller, but that there's been no material evidence to suggest that was actually the case. Uh, right. I, I like I as always when it comes to these types of things, like who kn- we'll see. Yeah. But, um, I, I I I think if I'm Louisville, Kansas, LSU, Arizona, Memphis, I feel better about my IARP case today than I did two days ago, if only because the panel chair of this uh, specific case just said we didn't really want to punish the students that are currently competing because if you give anybody a postseason ban you ain't punishing um you know you're not you if you give anybody a postseason ban going forward you are by definition doing something that they have already said they were reluctant to do yeah that's that's true um I don't know, man. It's, I don't either. I have no idea. But, but you know, yeah, I, I don't. It, there was. Um, I'm seeing in the chat. Someone's benching Louisville for Bowen. I don't remember off the top of my head the Bowen figure. Uh, yeah, I, I do think it was more than forty thousand. I, I want to say it was like. Again, this is off the top of my head. Was it five payments of twenty grand, and they didn't, and only the first one got made? Maybe. Yeah, I think the I agreement one hundred thousand. There were five, five twenty grand payments. That might have been like that. Yeah, I the, the number hundred thousand stands out to me. That was, but that was a little bit like last minute Christmas shopping. Like you had to pay above, you had to pay above <laughs> market price for Brian Bowen because you were getting it, you were getting it done so late in the process. That's uh, that's correct there. But you know, there was no emergency podcast because we didn't need to. This is just a kind of a secondary segment on today's show. But it's notable. I mean, it's the first IARP case. This process has taken forever and. Um, I did find it interesting that Godfrey only now they didn't they couldn't prove they didn't they said that Godfrey was not directly involved in facilitating the payment to Dennis Smith, which as far as I am concerned, it's like whatever. Like you know, coaches that don't want to be involved don't necessarily have to tangibly be involved as long as you're kind of taking care of your business. Not to say that he for sure was, but it was a little surprising that Godfrey only got one year and then early got six. Um, but early early didn't communicate uh communicator participate in the investigation whatsoever Gottfried had to and so he only gets one year I just thought his punishment might be a little bit a little bit harsher um than that but yeah I'm not gonna feel sorry for somebody who decides I'm not gonna you know even try to make my case with the NCAA like you get whatever you get at that point um clearly there's a discrepancy between what Mark got and what Orlando got but like Mark talked to him and and Orlando didn't so you get what you get I've always thought like if I were a head coach who had a who was you know locked up in this type of stuff and had a an assistant coach also involved like i would pay the assistant coach whatever we need to pay um because these guys are millionaires multi-millionaires 
I would pay the assistant coach to actually cooperate with the NCAA and tell them my coach had no idea what I was doing. I'd make him, I'd make him good to go in there and, and take the bullet for me. And yeah, I would get a, um, a, a failure to monitor charge, um, but I would almost be insured it would go no further than that. Like the best thing for Bill Self is that TJ Gasnola testified under oath that Bill Self had nothing to do with nothing. And, you know, you can believe that if you want to or not. I don't care. But the fact that TJ Gasnola said that under oath, mm -hmm. I think is going to help Bill Self um, going forward. And, um, I don't know why I'm always thinking about what I would do if I were in some mess, <laughs> but, but I, I, I like if I were Mark got and, and Mark got out of this pretty good. I don't know if he'll keep his job at Cal state Northridge, but whatever, it certainly wasn't as bad as it could have been. Um, because it, it, you know, it defies logic to think that he didn't know what was happening. Um, considering there's, he's on the phone with TJ and text messaging with TJ all while this stuff is going on, but whatever, he uh he he got a minor um a, a minor penalty all things considered um in this IARP case so it worked out but I don't know I've always thought it's smart pay somebody who can't get out of it to just take all of it and and insist his boss had nothing to do with it like if we ever go down I'm gonna pay you okay. I'm gonna pay you You're saying this on the record just so you know. Yeah, yeah. If if you and I ever go down some sort of scandal, I'm gonna I'm gonna make you right. I'm gonna put a gun on Orlando early, get some cash, then give it to you for you to go on the record and say, GP didn't know anything about what was going on. I was I was the mastermind of all of it. I handled every bit of it. GP is just caught up in it because he's connected to me, but he didn't really know anything about it. How much do I gotta pay you to make you do that? I mean, you see the fatal flaw here, though, right? Hmm. <laughs> he, just did. he admit it. He say it. It's <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a, But I'm about to unplug my computer. So this will okay. all just disappear. Oh, really? I, I think I think YouTube is forever. Um, but I love it. Uh, yeah, you, you might need to put a gun on me in order to for me to uh, to go along with that one, man. I'll I put a gun know. on you. OK. <laughs> man. Quite the holiday episode we got going on here. Um, I saw in the chat, by the way, someone said, what's the best Radiohead album? Um, all from Music Chatter all the time. The best. Okay, com OK, Computer. That's the best. My favorite is the Benz, but OK, Computer is, is the best. So we'll uh, we'll get to some more maybe uh, reader questions at some point here. Maybe we can do that as a special little Christmas Eve if we got a little segment at the end on uh, Thursday show. Reminder, by the way, a couple things before I give you the heads up on tonight's games. So first of all, if you haven't already, Please like this video. If you're watching live or if you've come to this afterward, if you're one of those that uh, that can't get to it on time but like to watch, click the like video, the thumbs up if you haven't already. Um, I'm going to get together with our bosses. I we Apparently, we've got some eye on college basketball mugs and pint glasses in the shop, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if we can do maybe a little trivia time or something for everyone that can watch the show live Thursday, 10 a.m. Eastern. Thursday, 10 a.m. It'll be our last show before Christmas. Try and give away uh, three three pint glasses or, or mugs to listeners and a uh, little, little Christmas giveaway. So we'll try and we'll try and do that on Thursday show as well. Uh, increase engagement, get people to watch. If you're listening and not watching the Tuesday episode, but you want to watch Thursday cause you want a little, little eye on college basketball merch. We'll try and make that happen for you. And if you are listening to this podcast right now on Spotify, did you know, I'm going to bring it up on my phone right now, Spotify, it doesn't have reviews yet. And we continue to love and be thankful for our Apple reviews. Um, in fact, I think for the Thursday show, who knows how much we're going to have to talk about. I almost think we should have a little, I'll bring up a little Christmas music on the board. Maybe Parrish reads like three or four of his favorite reviews recently or in past months, like, like a little Christmas story around the fire. Maybe we try and even work that in on Thursday show and we can have a lot of fun with this. Um, but Spotify has ratings now. There's no reviews, but if you're listening on Spotify or if you sometimes listen on Spotify, if you go to the show page, bringing it up right now, 28 of you have realized this and we are at a perfect 5.0 stars. Keep it up, Spotify gang. We love you there. So to our Apple gang, Spotify gang, YouTube gang, we love you all. To the crews that listen on other platforms, we know you are dedicated to those as well, and we very much appreciate you. But uh, thank you for continuing to support the show in whatever way you can. Our YouTube following has been pretty 
good pretty early. I don't think uh, CBS has had a podcast be this uh, had had this many subscribers. Oh, look at dead legs! I am bragging. Just what's told to me? Brag! Oh, dead hashtag dead lead bragging. Told to me. Okay, Wednesday night. I gave you the Tuesday games on the Sunday episode. If you want a quick refresher here, these games. I mean, this could be canceled within thirty minutes of us me saying this. But Xavier at Nova, UConn, Marquette, Davidson, Alabama, Kansas, Colorado. Those are probably your four best games of Tuesday. Um, the Yukon Marquette and Kansas, Colorado are 9 p.m. tips, and the other two games are 7 p.m. tips. And then for Wednesday, of course, we've got the Kentucky Western Kentucky game. And then the other two that we're most likely to discuss on our Thursday show Arizona at Tennessee. Please don't have that game be canceled. That's uh, the two top 10 Ken Palm teams right now Arizona at Tennessee. And then Virginia Tech will play at Duke. That's a nine o'clock tip on Wednesday night, and that could be intriguing as well. So that's uh, that's what's to watch for on Wednesday. If you have not yet finished your Christmas shopping, please get it done now. It's the 21st, 21st in a pandemic. Don't be putting yourself in a corner. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Kenny Morgan, legend. Shouts to Larnell. Thank you guys once again. Listen to our own college basketball podcast in the middle of the Dumbest pandemic of my lifetime. Woo! Woo! <laughs> I swear to you, man. I swear to God. What the? I never seen one like this, man. That's what they say. I never seen one like this. Omicron? What in the world? I know. Omicron? You serious right now? Are you serious with this Omicron? If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. We need five stars. If you've ever had sex before you were married, go leave a five-star review. If you're hoping to do that before you get married, please <laughs> go we did. leave a five-star <laughs> We did good. If you haven't and you uh, your sights are set high, you have optimism, you've got gumption, Get it done. Five stars. We, we actually did get a review from somebody who was like, I've, I, I have not had premarital sex yet, but I am planning on it. <laughs> he was fired up. I hope you, I wish him luck, man. Be safe. Make sure you get consent. Be safe. You saw what they just did to that guy from Sex in the City. I, this, I, dude, I, this dude died on a Peloton in the show and then got like multiple sexual misconduct allocations immediately. Oh my gosh. Now he's done. Make sure you get consent. That's right. Be, don't be a creep. <laughs> don't be a creep. Be safe. But if you if you ever had premarital sex or you're planning to do it, please go leave a five-star review at Apple and at Spotify. And if you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, knock that out, please. If we don't continue to set records, Deadleg won't be able to brag about it. So we need you to keep... Uh, Adding subscriptions daily. And while you're there, always smash the like button. That's what Brandon Davies would do. My man cost himself a possible trip to the Final Four just because he wanted to smash. Smashing the like button on YouTube doesn't cost you anything. So you got no excuse. Go knock that out. We're going to talk to you again on Thursday morning. Till then, take care.